Hello and welcome everybody to uh, an episode of Data Dog On. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, uh, thanks for being here. We're really excited to uh, to put this episode together. Data Dog On is a series of live streams hosted uh, about once a month or so, and we usually invite a couple of our internal engineers to talk about a number of things that they're working on, some of the challenges that they've been faced with. Uh, and really just let you, the audience and customers and everybody else out there, uh, learn a little bit about what we're doing, what are the challenges we have um, as as Datadog, and maybe you can take some of that stuff and apply it to some of the systems and situations that you have. Um, so anyway, thanks for being here. Uh, just so you know, if you've never seen a Datadog on episode, uh, they're all live streams just like this. You can, of course, join us in the questions. Uh, if you're watching on LinkedIn, ask questions in the chat. If you're joining us on Zoom webinar, uh, just pop your questions into the Q&A panel, and we will keep an eye on that, of course, throughout the live stream. We've got some time set up at the very end, uh, just specifically for questions. So, um yeah, drop your questions in and we'll do our best to answer all of that. Also, once these things uh, end up being uh, streamed, we rec we're recording, of course, we'll do some light editing and then we'll post these out onto the Datadog On uh, website, which you can get to at datadogon.datadoghq.com. Uh, we've also got a YouTube channel, so you can go check out some stuff over there. So that being said, today we are talking about data science. So uh, I've invited a couple of amazing guests from our data science team, uh, some folks that I met a few months ago uh, due to some internal um, events that we were putting on, and they had some really awesome sessions. Uh, maybe we can chat about that and chat about some of that here in just a moment. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to... Um, just share a little bit about Datadog. If you're not familiar with Datadog, for those who are uh, uninitiated, uh, it's Datadog is a platform for um, customers, for you, for whoever, for companies to improve your obs observability and security uh, for your infrastructure, for your applications, for all of it. So uh, that's all I'm going to say about Datadog. If you have any questions about Datadog, we're of course happy to answer that. But today we want to talk about data science. So my name is Jason Hand. I am a senior developer advocate here at Datadog. Uh, really excited to be hosting my first episode. And today's guests are, like I said, two members of our data science group. And I'll let them both introduce themselves. We'll start with Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, why don't you say hello and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hi. Thanks, Jason. Thanks uh, for talking with us tonight, inviting us. Uh, I'm a senior data scientist at Datadog. I've been at Datadog for almost four years now. And previously, I've been working in computer vision and in the online advertising. And at Datadog, uh, I've changed uh, tracks a little bit, working with time series and anomaly detection. And we'll talk about that later. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again for being here. And Clement, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Clement. I'm a data scientist at Datadog for about three years now. And um, I've, I worked a bit on security projects, and now I'm I'm almost fully working on this um, third-party monitoring initiative. I, I think we'll come back to that uh, later on. Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. And uh, speaking of what we're you know going to be coming back to, here's our full agenda for the day. Uh, we've got the introductions out of the way. Now I want to um, have both of our uh, experts here. Uh, just share a little bit about what's going on with data science at Datadog and also give you a little bit of their own uh, interpretation of what data science means at Datadog. Uh, and then we'll jump into a few use cases, show you some models, some of the things that we've been working on. And then, like I mentioned, we've got time at the end for any kind of questions. So uh, with that being said, uh, maybe we'll start things off here. And I'm just going to turn to you, Clement, and tell us in your own words, uh, what does data science at Datadog mean? Yeah, interesting question. Um, so I think it's really, so at Datadog, yeah, so we have our product, you mentioned it uh, briefly, Jaden. I think data science at Datadog is really about bringing this uh, extra layer of intelligence on top of everything that's we, that we're doing um, in the product. And it's so our, pro, our, our AI product is called Watchdog. Um, and, um, I think, uh, so the main thing, and you can go to the next slide. I think we, we put something about that, but it's really that, um, we're trying to, uh, give our users some insights 
about what's happening in their uh, application, infrastructure and application. And we are trying to do that without having to do any extra setup compared to already having Datadog setup. And how it uh, really appear, appears in, in the product is by having all those little, uh, we call them Watchdog Insights cards that appear and pop up everywhere in the app. And uh, they can be about like latencies, errors. It's uh, it's really about co uh, connecting the dots um, um, in the application about all the data that the all users have and trying to surface anomalies and to isolate some uh, signals uh, from the noise that is in all those uh, telemetry data. That's really how I, I, I would put it uh, in a nutshell. Awesome. And Anne-Marie, you got anything you want to add to that? No, I think uh, Clement summarized it well. We it's like finding the needle in a haystack, uh, but there's usually not just one needle. There are several ones, and we want to connect them together, uh, and that's the role of RCA. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know, also as we were prepping for this, Watchdog is something we chose. We're, we're going to be talking a lot about some of it. Is again just based on um, pre presentations and things that we've been working on internally, some other stuff, um, but. Uh, yeah, I feel like this has been um, very heavily. Uh, well, our plan, anyway, has been very heavily surrounded around Watchdog. But as we'll as we'll touch on later on, there's a lot of other things that are going on within data science, uh, within Datadog, uh, not just Watchdog. But uh, Clement, maybe you can uh, give us just a little bit more on you know some of the things that you've been sort of working with when it comes to this third party monitoring stuff. Yeah, so so that's super true. As you say, the Watchdog's not the only thing, but I think it's maybe the, the first thing we, we think about when we think about data science at Datadog. And yeah, this project, so third party monitoring, uh, we're going to talk a bit about, uh, is is really, so it's in Watchdog. It's one of the things we're doing and, and it's not everything. It's just one single thing. And I'm talking about that because I worked on it and it's it's what I, I know the most, but uh, it's it's a great example also how we're, we're trying to to isolate some signals in, in our data. So the, the use case here is really about um, our customers have some third parties. Uh, they call some APIs, external APIs. And um, sometimes they get er errors or some latency issues. And it's really hard when you're just uh, on your own to, to, to know if it's something happening with your own application or if it's uh, something broader, if it could be an, an outage of uh, your third party. So the idea of the of the initiative is really to, um, uh, because we we have many data from subset of customers and we can um, we can aggregate that, that data and say uh, at a high level is it something happening for everybody is it uh, um, an issue with with a provider and we can uh, get that that um, that information and and give it back to to our customers to um, to help them in troubleshooting because. Um, knowing that can save um, quite some time rather than digging and finding out, oh, it's just this third party uh, being done right now. Yeah, and uh, real quick, I Amarin, mean, before you jump in there, I, one of the things that we were talking, Kamal, um previously is when it, when it comes to this project, you know, we're, we're monitoring the other services and sometimes it sounds like you actually may know that they're having a problem before they've Put up even a status page or has have announced any sort of problems. I'm curious what maybe really prompted this project in the first place for you. Yeah, so that's um, the project is is customer based. I think it really came from uh, demands uh, our customers uh, have about uh, those outages, and some of them, um, uh, yeah, had had this need to uh, to have insights, as you said, before uh, third party officially acknowledge there was an issue. So yeah, it's, it's really a, a need that was um, uh, that was surfaced uh, from our customers. Mm -hmm. And, and Amory, did you, you have another comment you wanted to add to that? Yeah, uh, I think that you guys showed uh, how a data science a data dog is much more than just uh, analyzing data and getting insights from, from it. It's really about applying machine learning methods uh, and more generally statistical methods to extract the information. Uh, and yeah, as I, as I said earlier, getting that needle out of the haystack, not just doing data analysis, but really doing machine learning 
and uh, extracting the information and doing yeah. some uh, pred predictions as well. Right. And I was just about to say, I bet you that 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 prediction element of it, when you're when you're right, you know, when your predictions uh, come true, it's probably a little bittersweet uh, to know that, you know, everything is working uh, in terms of detecting these things. But uh, um, but then again, this, the, the service that you're relying on is having a, is having an issue. So the idea that you can use the machine learning data um, to actually sort of predict the future, I think, is has got to be a really kind of double edged sword feeling um, when it comes to that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's so, true. We we are always emphasizing what's not going well, but uh, but yeah, of course, most of great... the time you won't get alerts, and it will be fine. Absolutely, yeah, that's a great point. Um, sorry, I, so I moved on to the to the next slide here. I think Anne Marie's you've got a few things you wanted to point out here. Yeah, I wanted to get deeper into that topic of how we consider data science and how it uh, is different from. Uh, what we are much more used to do at Datadog, which is software engineering. And Datadog is a very strong software engineering company, and I believe all the previous uh, Datadog on episodes were uh, very much focused on engineering topics. Uh, so data science, I like to present uh, as a comparison with software engineering, taking like a very uh, high level view uh, that when you do classical software, uh, basically your role is to write functions that are going to process the data and you have some kinds of input which is usually well defined. You can write uh, function signatures, uh, you know, the types of your data usually. Uh, and then from that you have specification and you can define an output. With data science, the specification itself is not given. It's uh, the data which uh, you, you have usually large amounts of data. Uh, and the idea is that you're going to write a training algorithm from which you you are going to be able to uh, define the function. So the function is going to be uh, dependent on the data. And how you know uh, what the output looks like, it's just by looking at a lot of data. Uh, so if we take an example, maybe you can switch. Uh, Go to the next slide. Uh, for a classical problem, you define a sort function, you take a list as inputs, and you know exactly what to expect as the output. Uh, there can be edge cases, of course, with NANs or uh, duplicates, but you know what to expect, even in that case. So very, uh, I mean, we could caricature and say, basically, you can write everything with rules and mathematics, uh, mathematical functions. Uh, it's it's a, a clear definition. You can write unit tests to validate that it works on all the edge cases that you can think of, and you can explain uh, very much uh, what the function does. If you look at uh, data science, on the contrary, uh, you can click uh, to see the example. Uh, for, for instance, when we do anomaly detection, we could actually do anomaly detection by writing rules, uh, like say, uh, if the data goes over a threshold. But an anomaly is much harder to define. And usually, it's easier to define by saying, OK, I have these kind of time series. And these points there are just not normal. Something happened there. I want you to find that. And uh, it shows that data science, uh, the problem is defined <laughs> with a list of examples. It's not like you can write an easy rule uh, to define uh, what you want to do. And then it means that uh, how can you make sure that what you do is correct? Uh, well, you have to rely again on the data. And that's why we do, we're going to use statistical accuracy. And yeah, there there's also uh, the outcome, which is going to be ascertained by nature. Um, it's because the anomalies are a good example. Uh, what is an anomaly is difficult to say. That's something we'll get back to uh, later. Uh, and yeah, it, it's it's why, I mean, even if you think of images of cats and dogs, it's easy to say this is a cat or a dog for a human. Uh, but there can be many other things you can say about the image, and it's going to depend on the context a lot. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think, 
Go ahead, yes. Kamal. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say that, um, yeah, it's interesting and I really like to see it um, that way about like uh, uncertainty, framing it as, a, as an uncertainty problem. And I like the comparison with uh, finance where we, you know, when investors are going to pick up uh, stocks and they look at uh, potential returns and they also look at the risk of uh, each stock. And to be clear, I'm not saying the risk is like something financial or something like security related, but uh, but you know, the risk is just showing a bad uh, bad signal, like showing a latency increase while they're not. But I, I like to think about it like we're trying to control the risk and uh, getting a super high re reward, which is that our, our function will uh, adapt to the user's data and will be tailored to the user need compared to like just having a role that is the same for everybody. So we'll have something that is way more um, valuable for, for our customer because it's it's tailored exactly to their data, but at the cost of a small risk that we can try to control, like saying, okay, we will have 1% chances of showing something that's wrong. Uh, no big deal. It will, it will just be like 10 seconds uh, lost for an engineer looking at the, the inside. And if it happens only like super tiny fraction of the time, I guess we're, we're willing to take that um, that risk to increase drastically the, the value of what we're showing to our customers. Yeah, basically there's a trade-off and it's part of the properties, I would say, of data science problems that you have that trade-off between uh, the accuracy and the risk of, I mean, uh, the value of what you're proposing. Uh, so the risk is that you, you say something wrong, but you you won't need to say something uh, for it to be valuable. And it's, it's also something we see with anomaly detection. We don't want to page people uh, for each and everything, but uh, we need to say something sometimes about the data, and we need to make, to find the right threshold and confidence. Um, and yeah, how strong is uh, our certainty that there is something wrong? And we'll never be able to make sure that we find everything because then it would mean that we're. <laughs> We're finding uh, too many things and there's going to be some noise. So we have to make trade-offs. Right? Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that came to mind when we were talking about this particular part of the of the session today, and I had made the comment that it just seems that, you know, so much of of the stuff that we're getting into these days in data science, machine learning or whatever is uh, is that uncertain, uh, you know, sort of property or sort of quality of of the world? Uh, we've got uncertain outcomes. Um, people always talk about the problems with machine learning or AI in general being so non deterministic. It gets it makes it really hard for us to to wrap our heads around what's going on, what to expect for the outcomes. Um, but one of you had made a really great comment. I don't know if this was a you know, quoted from somebody else. Some somebody else. Feel free to give credit where it's due. Um, but you said um, that. The uncertain outcome is, you know, this non-deterministic part of it. It's really not a problem. It's just more of a property of the situation in the state of affairs and, and you know, kind of just the challenges of data science in general. So I thought that was a really interesting spin or take on on the thing is, is just accepting the non-deterministic or, or uncertainness of, of the whole thing. And to me, that that really goes to the heart of a lot of the challenges that we have, not just at Datadog, but as an industry, as we start to see more machine learning um, components being added into our production systems, we're moving from this unit test type of world into something that we have to use, you know, statistical accuracy on. And we're used to like the rules being very firm and clear. And now it's just, you know, we've got a bunch of data examples and things that are being used to build, um, build models on. So uh, trying to figure out how we can go from the, the, what we thought was a little bit of an explainable situation uh, with our systems and, and how they're behaving good or bad. Uh, now we're kind of getting into the situation where they might not be as explainable. And I think that's something that all of us um, are wrestling with is how do we move into these, um, situations where we're relying on the machine learning, you know, data scientists and all this stuff. Um, but there is still that uncertainty that that I think still makes a lot of people a little bit nervous. I don't know if either of you have some some response to that. Uh, maybe Clement first. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting because, uh, oh yeah, something I think every, everybody listening to this can relate to is the chat GPT uh, um, uh, ChatGPT product that uh, came out about a year ago, I think. 
And it's it's something where, as you said, it's a bit the same. It's uh, the product is the uncertainty because you you don't want ChatGPT to answer the same to everybody. And it, of course, you cannot hard code all the questions that people are gonna uh, ask it. And I think there's a part of risk, and we've seen examples where people are are doing like uh, are tricking it, or and, and it can say it's like it can say things that are totally made up and and, and false. But it's always the same, yeah. The trade-off and Marie talked about. It's uh, trying to find a sweet spot where you you control the risk enough to make it into uh, uh, something that's interesting, but not too risky, not too noisy. So yeah. Yeah, Marie? that's a trade-off you live with. There are many things that you're used to doing that you can't understand fully. You just learned to trust. Uh, like for instance, people, uh, they don't explain everything uh, to you. Uh, they don't always abide by strict rules. Uh, no. And still, uh, you learn to live with them and work with them and trust them uh, based on your experience. And I believe we're going to be more or less in the same way with uh, all kinds of machine learning systems. Excellent. Mm. And, and Jason, you mentioned also uh, unit tests and just wanted to add something about that because uh, of course, we cannot try proper unit tests and be as exhaustive as we could for be for um, classical uh, classic software. But um, there are still some cases we can test. We can still write some fake data payload and with some anomalies that we expect to catch and check that our models are catching them, or we can make some uh, try to to engineer some uh, fake data that are normal state and expect the model not to catch them. And there are still ways to 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 deal with it. Just that it's trickier, it's a bit uh, less, uh, it's as always a part of uncertainty because the data evolves, it can drift and we can get some uh, some things we didn't anticipate. But uh, I think if we're doing things properly, there are still, there are still ways to mitigate um, the way all, all models are, are behaving. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think we're all going through a little bit of a learning curve or we will be going through a learning curve as we understand what's available to us to monitor what, you know, what, what new um, methods are there? Um, so all, all this is still so very new. Um, I'm sure we've got a lot of people, uh, you know, watching right now who have tons of questions. Uh, I will just say, uh, say I did respond to one question in the chat. Um, somebody had asked if we were going to have a recordings or, or, you know, recorded videos of these. They will be available. Um, they'll be on our, uh, just our regular Datadog on site. So if you go to datadog on .datadoghq.com, you can find not only this episode once it's ready, uh, but all of the episodes, there were some really great ones uh, here recently, some stuff on Kubernetes auto scaling, uh, some design system stuff. So, um, anyway, yeah, go find the re recordings there. Um, it might take a week or so, but uh, they'll be available for you. So we're looking forward to sharing those. All right. Well, let's uh, maybe get moving forward here just a little bit. Um, talk a little about some of our use cases, Emery. Yes. And first, uh, I think we should talk about the data that we have since we just said that we're building uh, out of data. Uh, so if you can show the, the next slide. Uh, and if you've used data that before, you've probably seen the dashboards with all kinds of time series, uh, and data visualizations of all kinds. I would group all data into two big groups, which are time series and what I call tags and entities. Entities is a very generic term because we collect all kinds of events, really. So uh, events uh, could be logs, traces, uh, uh, profile sessions, user sessions. Um, all these come up with a bunch of tags, usually, which allows them uh, to be categorized and uh, to understand the links between the different entities. Um, they're set into, uh, they're used into dashboards, notebooks, uh, which are also other kinds of entities. Uh, we have resources, hosts, etc. So a lot of uh, different types of data. Uh, but yeah, the bulk of our data still is time series and a lot of our work involves uh, time series. I mean, they could be built uh, looking at the stream of events that we ingest. So yeah, we try to uh, use all that kind of data to build uh, products and to surface uh, anomalies uh, of different kinds. 
Uh, and two uh, very important properties of uh, this data is that, as I said, we uh, care about anomalies. So these are rare events, usually. Um, they are unexpected. Uh, there are things that just don't look like others. Um, and they are, uh, we have a very, very large scale data. Uh, so we ingest, uh, I think, trillions of events uh, per day or something like this. And yeah, this is uh, what makes uh, our job difficult and challenging and interesting. Uh, it's also very much developer data. Uh, so that's data that we use also. Uh, and we dug through a lot. Uh, we can, uh, we, as data dog, uh, data scientists, we have to use data, data dog. So, yeah, we care a lot about using the, the data well. Yeah. And I just want to point out as a point of just clarification uh, on the tags and entities there, I'd, I'd asked earlier, like what, what specifically are you referring to when you mention entities? And at the bottom of there, it says uh, traces, profiles, and user sessions are, are kind of other examples of other entities, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And also maybe for people who are not as familiar as we are, it's the Datadog app, but like the the gray green little dots at the bottom right are CPUs, I think, CPU usage. And it's like an infrastructure map um, of uh, all yeah. host machines. In uh, So it's it's a it's a demo org, I guess. That's why so many of them are gray. It might not be the case for a real application, but that's just to... Yeah, I removed the, I removed the scale, so <laughs> you're right to mention it. Uh... Yeah, so green is low usage, red is high usage, and gray is middle one. So having a lot of gray is actually not too bad. Uh, but yeah, you, you can never tell. It depends on uh, what the CPU is actually doing, uh, what the machine looks like. It's, it's always fun to, you know, to export some images like this out of our demo that, that um you know, sort of system. As I'm sure everybody knows we have like a whole demo environment that we use to show people how Datadog works and take screenshots and like this. But of course, it's all just, you know, fake data and, and mm. people have questions about it. And and uh, there's really not much to say other than just this is data we use for uh, our demos and stuff. So, um, but yeah, I think um, having a, a, just an understanding of some of the basics of, of of these things is important. Obviously, green is good, red, maybe not so much. So good, good point out there, Clement. Um, move on to the next uh, the next bit there, uh, Emery. Yeah, I wanted to talk about a project I've been working on, so I, I know it well. Uh, that's the first project I did when I joined Datadog, and it's uh, called Log Anomaly Detection. Uh, and basically, it allows you to find errors. We we analyze all the logs that are ingested by Datadog, and we can see. There are spikes in some kinds of logs. Like uh, we show them uh, usually as watchdog insights, and they would show it like that way. And if you click on it, uh, then you can see that it's going to show the patterns. And that's the next slide. Uh, so patterns are groups of logs that are similar, uh, that are originally uh, from the same line of code, or so we can guess because we don't ha uh, have a code. Uh, but we we uh, see when the logs are similar, we group them together. And then we, we can see, build a time series based on that data and see when there are spikes in logs. So here, for instance, we can see there's a new uh, kind of log. Uh, we haven't seen that log in, in the uh, past. And we can say, okay, there's something wrong here because you have a huge spike of error logs. Uh, you should uh, take a look. Uh, so it was interesting because we had to deal with the huge scale of Datadog, uh, analyzing all the logs. Uh, and also to, we had to adapt uh, that pattern algorithm, uh, which was working on just batch queries from logs. We had to adapt it to analyze the stream of, of logs to. Uh, apply it in a streaming fashion. Uh, and then we run uh, the classic anomaly detection algorithm on the time series. So yeah, uh, it was a, a particular project to work with. I'm just wondering, um, was it what was the biggest challenge? Was it 
to scale or was it um, finding those meaningful patterns to group logs uh, together? Yeah, it's actually an interesting question because it turns out that it's when scaling that grouping by patterns uh, becomes a problem because uh, when you scale up, you end up having all kinds of weird logs. And an example, uh, we had logs with some uh, difficult patterns that were hard to, to match together. And we ended up having a lot of small clusters of logs when all the logs should be clustered together. And that's because we end up with edge cases. We also ten, uh, group logs by uh, series, uh, by service. Uh, we use a few tags. And yeah, some customers didn't know that and they, they would put like random tags so we, we wouldn't be able to cluster. So when you scale, you just end up with all the weird edge cases uh, and you have to deal with that and make sure that your system is resilient and robust to that and doesn't uh, just stop processing because of, of this. So it's a mix of both really. Uh, okay. I, I would say eventually the, 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 pattern, met, uh, the pattern clustering eventually from my point of view, uh, came up uh, as more difficult uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, the as you do more and more, the edge cases are more and more difficult to to tackle. Yeah, and and I think we can talk a bit about um, the full party monitoring project again. We talked a bit about it at the very beginning, but I want to talk more about the, the model uh, this time. We showed so the product ID is, is ready to to surface those third party outages and to inform customers about that. But what's interesting is that to do so we we came up with with this um it's called the hierarchical Bayesian model. I don't want to go into the specifics and some math equations. It would be fun, but do that another time. And um and just want to explain the the, the big picture and it's it's really about having those a subset of customers, let's here we have four customers, let's say, who are calling a third party and we see some errors from, from those calls. And we, we can so of course we can estimate the error rate independently, like saying once on customer two, you have three calls, two errors, you have like 66% error rate. Technically that's true from the telemetry data. But uh, the idea of the model here is to uh, have a more robust and a more uh, interesting estimate that is uh, using like estimating uh, several orgs at once and regularizing in machine learning with, we we call that regularization when, when we're uh, pulling or estimates towards some some value here it's zero for instance we see that customer two uh, in red it's like uh, confidence interval on, on the error rate that we would have here and it's um, it's not in the same range as we would have if we looked only at customer two. So this model is really about uh, um, estimating several uh, um, orgs together and, and running the estimates. And what's interesting as well is at the top, you see we have like a confidence interval on, on the third party itself. And that's uh, in, in the Bayesian uh, modeling, it's it's derived from the, what we call the prior distribution. And it's just a way to model the, um, the third party uh, on its own and saying, okay, what's the... Uh, estimate we have for the error rate of uh, this third party, given all the data we are observing right now. And from that, we can build an, an alerting system and, and um, surface outages. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I think you have a success story here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're referring to the, um, yeah, because, so yeah, first, let's say that this, uh, this product is not uh, GA yet. so. But uh, we we've tested it and internally, and what we see, I think what you're referring to is we we caught this. Um, there was a, a big third party having an incident, and um, we were able to surface surface it like one hour before they they put an update on, on their status page. So that's really where is where the value is like having a super quick, uh, super short time to detection, and uh, being able to react as fast as, as possible. So yeah. Yeah. And we've got a question here that, that has come in. Oh, sorry, Amory. Uh, but yeah, I thought I just, uh, wanted, go yeah. ahead. I just wanted to mention that it's pretty cool also to see that what you were able to do was to apply 
classical math and just thinking about the model and doing it properly and you just got fantastic results I find yeah, yeah I'm a big uh, statistical uh, fan <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I because Clement, I know you're not going to do any uh, bragging about yourself or any any self promotion here, but I will say, uh, uh, Clement's got a talk a session that he's going to be uh, giving, or it's already been given, but you'll be able to review that at Nvidia's GTC conference coming up in about a month from now, where he goes specifically into this Bayesian model stuff. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today actually uh, will go or he does, uh, goes into quite a bit more depth. So for those of you who uh, might be attending uh, that NV NVIDIA GTC conference, you should check out the um, the schedule, the program, and uh, catch Clement's talk. It's uh, it's pretty rad. And, you know, just like um, Amory was just pointing out, like this this whole thing is pretty neat with with the Bayesian modeling, and it works really well too. So um, kudos to, to you and the team for um, kind of pulling that together because it's really been really fascinating to watch. So... Um, there is a question from chat that I wanted to uh, just kind of throw out here real quick about this third party modeling stuff. And is it, is it somehow tied with watchdog? Is it going to be its own? I know it's not, you know, it's a GA thing. We're not really uh, aware of, you know, not sure of probably a lot of the answers around these things, but is there anything else you can tell us about that? Yeah. So it will definitely be uh, in watchdog. Yeah. It will appear like a uh, scouts, uh, but yeah, I cannot say much about the, the GA. Yeah. Uh, um, release but uh, yeah yeah it will appear as cards okay great yeah keep an eye out i'm sure down the road um there'll be a lot more stuff around this this type of thing being uh, announced so especially come dash uh you know J june is always a good time for us to uh, share some of the things we've been working out so those of you who have never been to dash um you should check that out it's going to be going to be amazing as well all right well let's uh, move forward just a little bit here amor i think you had a few things you wanted to talk about when it comes to the signal finding stuff yeah, I think I'm going to keep talking about anomaly detection in time series. Uh, <laughs> one of the uh, topics that, that we have, uh, this is actually something pretty much all users of the data probably know because that was one of the first uh, watchdog uh, insights that we were finding. And that's one of the key parts of watchdog. It's about what we call signal finding. So finding anything that looks anomalous in your data. Uh, and we watch over a, a wide range of different metrics, uh, either uh, through integrations, you will look at infrastructure metrics, uh, AWS metrics, uh, or whatever. We also can also look at uh, APM uh, classic metrics like latency, uh, errors, it's, and we try to find uh, anomalies in there. So yeah, uh, this is again uh, something about scale and the difficulty of be finding something which is relevant uh, in the right context. And do you know how all those um, eight services impacted uh, are found? Like how do we find the, the impact on services? Yeah, so this is what we call RCA. So basically the idea is that uh, services are connected together. They might be using the same resources. Uh, and what we do is we build a, a graph uh, finding all the connections between services uh, and resources, etc. And that's what we use to find, okay, they, we have a dependency graph basically between services. And we can say, okay, if that service has latency high, uh, it, it means these services are likely to be impacted and we can check them uh, and see whether the late latency is increasing there. And uh, if so, we can include them. Nice, okay. Yeah, that's a great transition for what I want to talk next about, um, which is Bits AI. So, um, so yeah, it's um, so Bits AI is is um, an LLM based um, agent. We've released uh, Datadog uh, one year ago, and um, I say it's a great transition because uh, Bits AI is also about like finding the impact on on services if you have like an incident because this um, LLM powered agent is able to to uh, to help you ca carry investigations uh, when you have um, 
an outage and to find impacted services to and also to interact with Watchdog. And that's really what I, I like about it is that uh, in in you can ask him like um, uh, what are the what signals were generated by Watchdog uh, uh, at the same moment or to connect the dots. It's again about like this uh, this idea that uh, we want to uh, connect everything together and not having uh, single tracks. Uh, in in Datadog app, we want everything to to be. We want to if we see it as a big graph, we want the graph to be easy to navigate. Uh, thanks to to Watchdog and this bit AI um, product is helping in in that. So that's a, a great example of uh, um, maybe more uh, like uh, state well state of yeah state of the art machine learning we we have because it's uh, LLMs are trendy and I think in in some. Uh, in some applications as they shine. Yeah. yeah, I think that is a good point. Uh, you know, everybody loves Bits AI. Uh, lots of companies and services are looking for ways to inter introduce LLMs or chatbots that use LLMs or something. And and Bits has been um, sort of a surprise, I think, for a lot of us of how easy you can speak to it um, in natural language and what you can get out out of it. Um, so it's going to be fun really seeing how bits kind of evolves over time and how it starts to integrate uh, or all these things, I guess, start to integrate with each other. Um, but I think that's a really good point. Amory, you have, you have something about bits you wanted to mention also? It's more generally about generative AI because uh, on the surface, it looks uh, really nice, it's true, but it's a lot of work to actually make, make it work in a production setting and yeah the, that's what's also amazing about this is that we've been able to have this product uh in the in the past few months and yeah it, it was it's interesting because i was seeing uh an update i don't know if you've seen it it's something which has been up in the machine learning community for a while there's this hidden technical depth uh, diagram showing how just writing a model is not the big part of, of putting a model in production. You need to build a lot of what we call MLOps tooling. Uh, so evaluation sets, uh, data checks, uh, data preparation uh, pipelines. And for generative AI, this grows even more than for uh, classic machine learning. And yeah, it, it's really interesting to see that Again, the challenge is pretty much always how do we make sure that what we put in production is actually good, useful for the customer, uh, and can we evaluate it? Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, obviously, everything we do, you know, is always through the customer lens. Is this going to help solve their problems? Is you know the type of thing that they're going to rely on and need? So, good point there. Um, I think maybe yeah, we're, no, maybe... I just wanted to add yeah. something about about that yeah. because uh, it's interesting and Mario you said earlier yeah uh, it's in, that we're using like uh, statistical methods and but yeah, it's interesting because you are, you have a, a huge contrast between uh, using Bayesian statistics which is uh, like let's say old school even if I, I really like it and it works super well and using LLMs which are super trendy and it's uh, the latest thing in the, the machine learning uh, space and being able to take the best of uh, so the best method we, we need for each use case is, I think is the key uh, to doing proper machine learning in, in a company, like not being uh, now married onto some, 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 uh, onto a given method, but really using the, the entire uh, uh, variety of, of tools we have uh, at hand if we need to. Yeah, yeah that's a great point. We're very pragmatic about what we use. So if we don't need a complex model, uh, we want to use one. I mean, we try to be careful about how we use all resources as well. So yeah. And I think that's kind of a um, an important idea that you know I've heard for since I've joined Datadog is when it comes to a lot of our machine learning AI in general, we're taking a very pragmatic approach on what we're doing and and not just throwing something out there because it's trendy um, or that we think people you know really just need this type of stuff. We want to make sure that it, it it's helpful and that it works as expected. All those uncertainties, 
um, around models or, or things that we're, you know, not just us, but like as an industry, we're all trying to figure out together. How can we monitor these things? Something else that we're all figuring out together. So, uh, it's been, it's been a while since I felt like we, the, we've got something big that we're all kind of, um, moving towards together. Um, but doing it in a, in a, you know, safe and like I said, pragmatic way so that we're not just, uh, you know, th throwing something out there just so we have machine learning, uh, within, within our lineup of, of features and products. So should we uh, move on to the to the next uh, part here? Yeah, sure. So I was mentioning it about generative AI, uh, and it is a big challenge in generative AI to evaluate uh, their research on that topic. But uh, at Datadog, uh, we have we've always had uh, that challenge of evaluation because we care about rare events and. Uh, by definition, they don't happen very often, so we don't have a lot of data to train on. Uh, if we want to do classic supervision, uh, supervised uh, machine learning, uh, basically we don't have a lot of uh, labels. So we rely a lot on unsupervised learning, of course. We try to label uh, when we can. Uh, we can try to use proxies for labels. Uh, but yeah, this is a very interesting challenge that we have. How can we properly measure that what we do is actually going to be helpful for the user? So we can collect a, a bunch of different signals, okay? uh, proxies, as I said. Uh, and the hardest part is when we don't find something because, uh, well, then we can't really collect feedback on that. So that's why we say recall is really hard. Because uh, if we miss something, we don't know. And we really, really want to have a high recall because we are finding potentially helping our customers to fix incidents sooner. So helping them that way is very uh, important. But uh, yeah, that's something which we have a hard time measuring. I fully agree. And I would like to, to add about rare events um, that it's also what makes it so interesting because um, we want to, the fact that those events are, are rare is uh, where the value is because we we want to be able to, to say, oh, this latency increase, that would have been super hard to find out of the box. We are able to find it uh, uh, using machine learning. So it's both the, the challenge and the, as we said before, it's, it's a product in, in some sense. Yeah, it sounds like uh, you know this is maybe just a theme in in data science in general, or at least within Datadog. Of there's all these unique and novel challenges that that we haven't seen before, that is actually uh, bringing some motivation to the to the picture. It sounds like in terms of how we address these things, you know, solving problems, solving the hard questions for our customers and ourselves. I mean, obviously we we data we, we dog food our own uh, system, very heavy users building it out, uh, to improve our lives as, you know, as engineers. So, um, I think there's, there's a lot there that we're, um, still just right at the edge of understanding and learning. And it feels like as scary as that is, it's also very exciting. At least that's the tone I'm picking up from, from both of you is that you love this. It does not necessarily frighten you, um, that there are unknowables and, and uh, things that are, you know, hard, such as recall. Um, is that, is that true in, in data science or maybe at least across our team? How we like uncertainty. Yeah, that's definitely what makes it interesting. Uh, and even if it's hard, it doesn't mean we don't have ways to uh, work with it. I mean, we we definitely find uh, ways to deal with that issue and to make sure that uh, the product stays of high quality. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it feels like that's just that's kind of built into the culture here at Datadog is we, we actually run head first into some of those challenging um questions and problems and, and love and love taking them on. So, well, we've got uh, just a little bit of time here left. So let's, let's move forward here. I know there's a few more things we wanted to touch on. Yeah. I think we, we just wanted to show a concrete example of uh, time series and, and um, an anomaly. So, and just to, to comment, I think uh, from this graph that we see is, so there, there is an increase and um, uh, what's hard to say is uh, should we show that to, to our users, um, if it was a real time series in the wild, and 
I guess the answer is yes and no. Probably yes, if you look at the graph here, but maybe if you scope that, you would see there are other spikes, the same high uh, happening right before. And, you know, it's not always um, that uh, trivial to, to answer. But uh, yeah, that's just to, to showcase that defining the what an anomaly is, is not a, an easy task. Yeah, and that's why we very often we are going to rely on the context and try to see whether that anomaly happens by itself or if there are other anomalies happening on related services or on the same service but on different metrics. Uh, so, of course, the anomalies on different metrics don't necessarily have the same kind of shape. Um, like, even here, if you think it's a latency, if it's short enough, it might not be a big deal. If it's uh, a number of errors, that might be another issue. Uh, so yeah, we they try to find correlations uh, between the different signals. And that's where we get back to uh, having all this data about different entities and connecting the dots. Yeah, and, and I guess to, to sort of make this come back full circle, we'll connect all those dots around. Um, when it comes to Watchdog, which is where we sort of started the conversation today, um, how, how does this all tie back? You know, you know, the challenge of evaluation, some of the things we were just talking about. What, where does that, where does that link us back to? What, what's going on with Watchdog? Well, the the idea of Watchdog is really to surface all of these signals and show them in the right context uh, and yeah, uh, with also the right amount of information. So that's where we, I don't remember the exact wording we had, but uh, we try to surface all of these. We show them either as insights or we can alert when we think the signal is strong enough. So we have different levels of severity and confidence that we can assess to decide uh, what action to take. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely how we built Watchdog until we take all of the signals from different sources and different kinds of uh, data uh, that we can analyze. And then we try to show them at the right place where the user is, uh, if it's only an insight, and we can add it uh, if it's something we, we think is worth it. Great. And and before we move on, uh, and like I said, we've only just got a few more minutes left. A, a question did come in um, that I thought I'd read out to uh, to either one of you here. Um, are there any possibilities to identify cause and effect relationships between metrics, comma, services, question mark? Would it be possible to, quote, train Watchdog to understand those relationships? Either of you want to take that one? Uh so the first question, basically, that's what we call RCA. So uh, that's why uh, we are uh, we are doing. Uh, that's what we are doing uh, with uh, what we call RCA. So root cause analysis, uh, and the idea when we say root cause analysis, the idea is to get back to the actual root cause of an incident. But we we see that as a more larger problem of getting back. Uh, finding the connections between and helping you in investigating uh, for the incident. Uh, how much we can train? Well, we have a lot of data, so we, we can uh, yeah uh, can try to learn. Uh, yeah, it's not necessarily how we are doing it uh, now, but that's the direction we are taking. Great. All right. Well, let's move on forward here. Um, we've got a few takeaways uh, we thought we'd share with you from today's uh, today's session. And I can kind of go through these and if each of you want to add a little bit extra to it, uh, go for it. Um, but our first takeaway here is that there are many different models that all work together and uh, for different purposes and use cases. So just understand that there's, there's a lot going on here. Obviously we can't share everything we do, what, what's going on behind the scenes, um, but there's a lot. Um, that, that goes into these use cases. Either one of you want to add something more to that? Uh, no, I, I think, think yeah, that, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. No, no, go, go ahead. Um, 
the the next takeaway we have here is that evaluating uh, this is all a challenge, of course, and uh, like many things, context matters. Maybe context really matters is what we should put in here. A anything else you want to add to that? Well, that's what we just said, and that's where why we try to go towards something, including uh, with cause analysis. That's why we want to add more context to the insights that we show you. Uh, that's because. Yeah, a jump in latency by itself may or may not be a problem. So you need to know more about the system. And when you investigate, you just find the different clues and try to connect them together. And that's what we're trying to do to automate. Great. And then our last one here is Watchdog is about connecting things together. Come on, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, so I think, yeah, that's a theme that came back uh... All along, but really, yeah, the idea is that, uh, and it's a, yeah, it, it's a bit, a bit of the same thing with context is that, um, it's ev everything is tied in, in an application. You cannot, uh, of course, you can isolate that at the service level, but uh, there are always things that are interacting together. Even the, the third party monitoring example, it's, it's about, yeah, you, you could look at your service and see those errors, but if you have the insight already there, it's telling you all. Oh, this third party is impacting your service. Why would you need to dig in um, more in depth if you have it out of the box? So it's always about simplifying everything, making um, the app more uh, um, easier to 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 to. I don't find the words, but like to to easier to navigate the graph. I like to see it as a graph, and yeah, I think it's really is that that we're trying to achieve with Watchdog. Yeah, I think it's funny because the three takeaways are really related together. If you look at it, it's saying basically you can see the world through different angles and then the different data sources or which could be called use cases that we have. But there are really different views, different pipes into the same world. Uh, so that's why we want to connect to get them together. And if we don't, I mean, if we you take an event by itself, it's really hard to evaluate. Uh, so you want to connect everything to evaluate, but it's also very challenging. So it's kind of chicken and egg problem because uh, you can't evaluate out of context, but even with all the finding all that context is hard and evaluating globally is also very hard. So. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um... Thank you so much for all of that. We've got just about a minute or two here for questions. So um, there have been some great questions coming in. Thank you to the audience. Thank you for everybody who's joining us both in Zoom and on LinkedIn. It's been awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Kamon Amari. Um, just one question here, maybe as we're as we're starting to end things. Um, are there any tools, technologies, frameworks, uh, forums? Is there anything you can share that um, has been really help with, has been a big help with a lot of your efforts? Uh, maybe anything in experimenting, just something we can share with our audience that uh, is maybe part of your tool set that uh, others might want to look at. Um, yeah, so specifically regarding like the, the Bayesian model, I'm, uh, I've been using NumPyro framework every day. Uh, so it's in Python. And I will just emphasize also that um, for production workloads, uh, we're using Flink, which is a streaming uh, framework. And I find it super great uh, for to aggregate data and, and to handle uh, high scales. So yeah, that for, for the third party monitoring project, which I worked on mainly, it's, those are the two components that uh, allowed it to, to go to production. But uh, Amory, in the in the twenty seconds or so that we have, uh, any other tools you want to share with our audience? Uh, not much. Uh, for log anomaly detection, actually, we didn't use Flink. We we had our own uh, in-house uh, pipeline, uh, very much like like Flink, but uh, more resilient. And uh, also, yeah, for experiment tracking, a lot of people are using uh, MLflow. Otherwise, we use uh, the classic uh, that. All data things just use like Jupyter and Goose yeah, and the likes. Yeah, yeah so that's unfair not to well, not books. Um, 
it has been awesome having both of you here uh, talking about what's going on in data science at Datadog. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Again, thanks to everybody in the audience uh, who has joined with some great questions. Uh, all this has been recorded. We'll make it available to you as soon as we can. Just check out for that. Um, check out the website for that. And if you have any other questions, um, feel free to reach out to us. We we uh, love hearing from y'all. And I guess with that, I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye. And it's been a real pleasure doing another episode episode of Data Dog On. Today was Data Dog On Data Science, and we will see you all next time. Bye. Thanks. Bye. See you.